Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Peck. I am the director of the Reconfigure Robotics Lab. What are the Reconfigure Robots and what are software robots? It's basically a strange robot, and I'll tell you how this is going to change our lives in the very near future. Why are you making software robots? Why do robots need to change? Why are we so interested in robotics? We are very familiar with this type of robots, where we've been designing robots toward better and stronger, faster, more accurate uh, mechanical performance. They were designed for the environment where we had highly predictable outcomes and highly programmable environments. They worked absolutely great. That's how we made iPhones, cars, um, computers. It's been great. But we want more. We want these robots to interact with us. And this environment is quite different. We can no longer rely on this programmability and predictability. These are the robots that need to work in this real world environment. When your calendar changes, your robot needs to follow it. And this means you can no longer just rely on their mechanical performance, but you need to rely on their reconfigurability, adaptability, and most of all, the safety. But how do you design such type of robots? Now we are faced with a huge dilemma. These are the four axes of robotic design that everyone wants to achieve. High degrees of freedom, high precision, high force output, and structural compliance. However, what you see here is quite strange. The arrows are all juxtaposing. These are the criteria that you can not quite meet. These are the oxymorons of the design. Is that really impossible? For humans, it actually we do it quite nicely. With the same hand that can thread a needle, can be the same hand that can lift up 264 kilograms of weight. That's the world record right now. However, this gold band has not yet to be met with any kind of a robot at the moment. Either we have a forklift that can bring up huge weights, or a starfish like a soft tentacles that can pick up strawberries, but not both at the same time. So what are the challenges that we need to overcome so that our robots can really take a benefit of this golden band of uh, the uh, paradise of design? I think there are three things that we must address. One, the novel design methodology. There is no cohesive way of designing robots at the moment. Second is a novel actuator solutions. You need to have the components that will allow you to do this. And third, which is often overlooked, is integration. If you're a, ma if you're a manufacturer and if you're an engineer, you will know this by heart. But this is no longer based on the artisanal hand skills and tuition. We need science to help this. And if you achieve all three, this is where my recovery robots come in. The technology and the scientific achievements and the future of these components put together are going to achieve by recovery robots. And that's what I've been working on the past 15 years. And that's why when you come to my lab, we have a whole bunch of robots, from exoskeleton for a rat on the left bottom corner to an uh, exosuit for humans, also for your face. So Tony Stark, here I come. I won't go through all the robots, but I can tell you they are divided into two major categories. One is uh, origami robots. Origami robots are characterized by their flat format. They are sandwiched layers with like, essential components, motors, sensors, circuitry, microchips. They are even controllable by a virtual reality environment and you can interact with the hardware. They can find each other's edges and combine, their, combine to create different folding robots. And you can make it as a platform by combining with passive and active joints. The second category of our robots are called soft material robots, where these actuators are quite soft enough that they can mold around your body. And particularly, they are modular. So depending on the application, you can put them together, disassemble them, and make them do a very interactive task. And they're so thin, they're even wearable on your arm sleeves. Where are we going with all this? I want my robot to be super interactive, intuitive to use, and compliant around its ever-changing environment. And for example, that will be the world's smallest haptic joystick that can feel 
or let you feel what the drone is feeling in the air. When there's gusts of wind and this disturbance, you'll be able to feel it directly under your fingertips. And when it's not in use, you can fold it away and put it in your pocket. And in our lab, even our logo is reconfigurable. So what is an origami robot? These are not the robots that make origamis, but these are the robots that seemingly change its form as if you're folding a paper. If you can embed essential components of robots in individual layers, you can achieve an independent motion for individual joints. And when you combine these joints throughout the uh, sheet of the robot, you can control how overall transformation of the robot can change into. And where can we possibly use it for? Imagine you direct the robot to go through a hole and execute its task. And if the hole is much larger or smaller than what you had it demanded to do, you won't be able to transform into an airplane. But because it's reconfigurability and adaptability of its hardware, it is able to carry out its task. This is obviously an animation, but it's not a science fiction. What we can achieve immediately is actually using the paradigm of this origami design into how we manufacture our robots. Manufacturing robots for mass production. How is that possible? We can take advantage of this virtually quasi two-dimensional manufacturing process that we often use for making microchips, NEMS, MEMS process. We assemble multiple layers, and then we put different components, these three components, and you reflow it to connect all the components back in the backbone of the robot. The magic happens now, though, self-folding. Imagine you can create a three-dimensional robot from a quasi-2D fabrication process. You're not only able to create a three-dimensional robot, but these are the robots that can execute three-dimensional tasks. They're basically popping off of the plane. The second type I was talking about was we need a new type of actuators. One of the go-to actuators that we are actually using at the lab is called pneumatic actuators. Pneumatic actuators are basically a glorified balloon that can be controlled to have a different types of forces and range of motion. And what's cool about this uh, controllable balloon is that you can make it a modular format. And because of our specific design of the modularity, we can create these uh, pick-and-place robot, which is not completely novel for uh, industrial robotics guys. But take this. Individual module has three degrees of freedom. Currently, we have four. How many degrees of freedom do we have? Twelve. But if you have ever sent a robot 12 degrees of freedom, all controlling with a one shot, almost impossible. Also, you, have you ever tried to assemble any type of TV or video systems. Cabling is the killer. Imagine trying to connect 12 different motors all at the same time. What do you see here? One power line and one pressure source. We are able to create multi-degrees of freedom robot without having to deal with this cabling and connection and grounding. And if you are running out of your modules, you can have only two modules to climb up a wall. In this case, a clear plastic. The assembly is done really under 30 seconds, which you can rarely say for any type of prototype, let alone a robot. And it wiggles its tail. OK, that's pretty cute. But what, if, what else can it do? What's the application? Well, imagination is your friend. If you have more modules, you can create different types of gate patterns. Not necessarily creating exact same patterns as a snakes, but what else can you do? Well, if you lose two on the way, like a lizard, you can still perform. Environments change, but the robot could still perform. And talking about different environment, now you're on a slope. Create different gait pattern. This can all done by intelligence of the mechanism itself. You can even customize how big these robots can be. So the pneumatic actuator I was talking about can become in a small, very, very novelly, novel platform. Here, we are wearing a robotic braille. Imagine you're Text does not come as a ding or emoticon or the visual text. It comes as a form of a vibration, a vibration that feels like a real poke when you get a poke from your Facebook account. And imagine if you have a textile, tactile pixels of textiles that can create multiple different forces and modulated frequencies. Now you're feeling very, very eerie on your forearm. 
Some of my students even call them, it feels like fish is kissing my forearm. And I hope I can convince you further out that three categories are the most important one for achieving reconfigurability of robots. But you don't have to take my word for it because we are getting familiar with how important the closed loop system is not only in control, but also in manufacturing and design. And what I mean by that is if we can achieve this golden fantasy of a closed loop system from application, in this case, you have robots that's communicating, uh, collaborating, and manipulating uh, different environments to the system design that has this uh, parameters, geometry, mechanism, materials, but having the newest part of a fabrication process, you can streamline your robotic manufacturing from the conception, from your given task, to manufacturing, to the actual design file that can be iterated. And that is really the ultimate closed loop system I want to bring to the uh, robotic design process. And you don't have to take my word for it because we do have the latest semi-product that is a foldable haptic joystick. It can render three-dimensional force feedback directly under your fingertips. Don't let the thinness and then tininess fool you. This can create up to one newton of force directly in your fingertips, where you can really feel the difference between different materials. And if you combine this with your virtual reality environment, you can pop a chip, you will feel a certain stiffness. You have a sponge ball, you will find a certain different stiffness. And if you have a billiard ball that has completely rigid uh, material characteristic, you will feel that as well. And of course, I'm coming from EPFL, Switzerland, Swiss cheese. And combine that with your goggles, now it's no longer augmented reality. It's a tangible reality. You become completely immersed in the system. You no longer have to wave your arms in the air. You actually feel what you're feeling in the air. And that allows us to really get immersed. And I think really the next step is having this allow us to have a really tangible feeling and better for communication. And where does it all lead to? The robotics, next frontier. These are the robots of a reconfigured robotics lab. Their mission, to explore strange new robots and seek the safe human robotic interaction and to go where no robot has gone before. Let these robots to save you and help you live long and prosper. Thank you very much.